Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our program tonight, this panel discussion, the glaucoma vital signs you may be missing, corneal hysteresis and IOPCC. I'm Dave Taylor from Reichert. Just gonna go over a few housekeeping notes here uh, before I turn things over to our moderator this evening, Ike Ahmed. Uh, so here's the basic agenda. Ike uh, Ahmed is gonna give an overview of kind of why we're here this evening. And then I'm going to do a very brief introduction of a measurement called corneal hysteresis that we're gonna focus a lot on this evening. And then we're gonna turn it over to the panel where we are gonna have our speakers and uh, moderator Ike Ahmed discuss a variety of very interesting issues that I know you'll find educational, educational and clinically useful. And uh, then we will have Q and A, but of course you're welcome to submit questions during the uh, webinar this evening. Please use the um, uh, text in a question uh, panel on your GoToMeeting control panel. I'm probably on the right side of your screen and um, uh, the moderator will see those questions and then be able to answer them or delegate them to one of the panel members. Uh, there are some handout materials that you can download also on your control panel, a few uh, PDFs, I believe, and probably a copy of the slide deck, things of that nature that you can download. Uh, this uh, webinar is being recorded and we will send out a link to the recording to all of the attendees and registrants after the webinar this evening. And also after the webinar is over, you will receive an email asking you to take a survey. It's a very brief survey, and we'd really appreciate it if you would take a minute to fill out the survey, let us know how we're doing. That's how we improve when we do these sorts of things the next time. There's also gonna be a couple of poll questions throughout the evening, uh, just, just a handful of them. Those are fun and interactive. Uh, so please participate in the polls when they pop up. Uh, tonight, uh, our moderator is Ike Ahmed. I'm sure most of you know who he is. He's world-renowned for his surgical skills and groundbreaking work in the diagnosis and surgical treatment of complex glaucoma and cataract cases. Published over 150 papers and books, and as a consummate educator, you know Ike's always on the podium or on the webinar. He's assistant professor at the University of Toronto, clinical professor at the University of Utah, and director of glaucoma and advanced anterior segment surgery fellowship at the University of Toronto, just a few hours north of me here this evening. Uh, and he is the medical director of his practice, Prism Eye Institute. So at this point, I'm going to make myself disappear and turn it over to Ike. Dr. Well, Ahmed. Well, thanks, Dave. I, I mean, we could have a debate on who has a better hockey team, Toronto or Buffalo, but we both probably will make the playoffs. So that might might not be a very good debate. And yes, I would love to be more at the podium than than here virtually, but that's the way we are. And so uh, it gives us an opportunity to share here online. Um, it is a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, this is a topic that for me has really, over the last few years, become of increasingly interest. And, you know, the title of this webinar is talking about glaucoma vital signs. And as we know, of course, with vital signs, whether they're heart rate, BP, uh, respiratory rate, or whether we're looking at APGAR scores or glaucoma or, or, or Glasgow glaucoma scores, you know, really vital signs are critical to assess the status of disease or the shape of, of how the human body is reacting to stress. Um, you know, we have a certain number of vitals that we look at for glaucoma. And traditionally, we have our usual values. Decision making is becoming more and more complicated, as we know. We have imaging, uh, we have perimetry that's been, you know, further advanced, and then we have a series of risk factors. Of course, IOP is a central part of that assessment, but we realize the shortcomings of IOP. And so, really, this kind of this webinar here is really to discuss how do we incorporate hysteresis um, in this decision making, risk factor analysis, treatment decision making, uh, and day to day management of glaucoma. Now, as opposed to the three speakers that we have here, I would have to say I'm a bit of a late bloomer when it comes to hysteresis. Uh, I've been following the world literature on hysteresis, understanding the ocular response analyzer, and it took me a while to really jump on sort of the journey of hysteresis. And what really for me convinced me was the work that one of our speakers uh, here has done, and that's Felipe Medeiros. I mean, he has published a tremendous amount of evidence looking at the role of hysteresis in risk analytics. Um, and learning from his work really uh, certainly inspired and convinced me that I need to look at this if I'm going to really appropriately get a handle on glaucoma vitals. And so for the last few years, we've been incorporating um, the ocular response analyzer, understanding hysteresis, looking at, uh, at the proper IOP values as measured, uh, adjusted for hysteresis. And for us, and we'll share this uh, here tonight, it's really become an important vital sign in glaucoma. So that's why we're here. We're here to share how do we use hysteresis? How do we use the values coming out uh, from Aura in terms of risk factor analysis and, and decision making and treatment? 
Uh, I'd like to introduce our speakers here. Uh, I'm very privileged to have this uh, distinguished group of uh, gentlemen here with me today. And if we can get our next slide, uh, I mentioned Felipe Medeiros, who is now at Duke University, distinguished professor. Um, you know, I think one of the most prolific researchers in our in our field today, particularly when it comes to diagnostics, whether it's imaging or perimetry, uh, or looking at population-based studies. And it's really his work. Um, you know, that incorporated hysteresis, incorporated the analytics of biomechanics of the cornea that led us to the evidence today that I think really supports this role. And it's very, very rare you find that kind of uh, precision in an instrument that's been assessed in a very large scale study that uh, Felipe has done. So we're very happy to have Felipe here and he'll be presenting uh, here as well today. We have Paul Singh, who uh, is someone who's touched almost all kinds of technology in glaucoma and anterior segment, uh, always adds uh, a nice little flavor to the discussion. Um, and although he's a cheesehead, uh, certainly is very credible and adds a lot of uh, flair to how he describes things. So we're happy to have Paul here as well and talk about the practicality of using hysteresis. And then we have Justin Schweitzer here as well, who uh, comes to us from the optometry and the primary care side. You know, tremendous amount of experience in a wide range of clinical settings, um, who will be able to give us some insight into how uh, he uses some of the values uh, coming out of the machine. Uh, and incorporate hysteresis and IOP as well. So before we get it started though, I wanted to get uh, Dave, Dave back here uh, to talk about hysteresis. Um, you know, what is hysteresis? How do you measure it? If we can get the next slide. And you know, may, some of you may or may not know Dave, but I would describe Dave with really, uh, you know, one term and he's basically a hysteresis nerd, right? <laughs> There's nobody who understands this as far as I've seen better than Dave. So I'm gonna get Dave uh, to uh, to discuss and uh, help us understand in a short time frame what is hysteresis and how do you measure it? Thanks, Dave. Well, thanks, Mike. That I appreciate that, and I'll take that as a compliment. This is our first opportunity here for an interactive audience poll question. So I'm going to do those two questions everybody gets to vote on here. Um, so the first question is: Do you, audience members, understand how to incorporate corneal hysteresis into glaucoma decision making? So you should see that poll on your screen now and you can vote on it and I'll be able to see the poll results coming in. Most people don't understand how to incorporate it into clinical decision-making right now. It's about 40% it's about, uh, no, 20% yes, and the rest of you say, I want more information. Well, good, I think that's what we're gonna do here this evening. So I'm gonna close that poll and then I'm gonna ask the second uh, question on the poll. And the second question is, do you feel that only Goldman IOP values, not other tonometric measurements, should be used for glaucoma decision making? So you'll see that poll on your screen now, and you can vote on that. Oh, it's wow, very surprising. This is this is good. I think we've moved the needle over the years, uh, gentlemen. 80%, 88% say no. I don't think Goldman is only the the only tonometer we should use for glaucoma decision making. So that's good. Well, I'm going to close the, the poll here then, and I'm going to get on to, uh, as Dr. Ahmed said, describing hysteresis very briefly. And I am a nerd, but I'm also a car guy. And so what you're going to see here in this video is uh, two wheels of a model car rolling over an elliptical surface. And the one on the right-hand side is out of control, bouncing up and down. And the other one on the left-hand side is uh, doing quite well. Everything about the, the right and left side of this model are the same, except on the right-hand side, we have a bad shock absorber. Uh, and you might think it's the spring's fault that that wheel is flailing around uncontrollably and jarring the teeth of the uh, occupants of that vehicle, but it's not the spring. A spring's job is to return energy. Springs are elastic, and that's what elasticity is. Uh, but a damper, a shock absorber, is a damper. Its job is to dissipate or absorb energy. And so the reason that this is important um, uh, to our discussion tonight is because the cornea and the eye is a viscoelastic structure. And when we talk about measuring corneal hysteresis, it's really the damper that we're talking about, not the spring. So people talk about um, uh, stiffness of the eye, elasticity of the eye, resistance of the cornea. Those terms do not quantify what we're measuring with corneal hysteresis. With corneal hysteresis, we're measuring energy absorption and dissipation. Uh, and if you think about the eye, it's a very stressful environment. You've got intraocular pressure, you've got pressure surrounding the globe, and you've got the ocular pulse hammering away on these structures of the eye 24-7. I heard somebody at a meeting once years ago say the eye is under a constant assault, and I thought that was a really good way 
to put it. And so the question is, can we measure the shock absorption capacity of the eye? And if so, what does it tell us about glaucoma risk? And I think that's uh, hopefully what our panel members are going to elucidate on this evening. The term hysteresis, just so you are aware, is not something we invented. It's been around for a long time. And it characterizes the response to application and removal of force in materials that dissipate a portion of the applied energy. So there you see a, a foam mattress. If that was a spring mattress, it wouldn't have a hysteresis effect. But because it's a foam mattress, it has a rate dependent um, uh, deformation relationship. The term was coined in 1890 by a Scottish physicist. And it's not new in medicine either. If you go up on PubMed and type in the word hysteresis, you'll find something like 13,000 uh, publications that discuss the term hysteresis. Corneal hysteresis specifically reflects the ability of the cornea to absorb and dissipate energy. It's patented, it's specific to the ocular response analyzer and is the world's first in vivo measurement of ocular biomechanics. People talked about biomechanics of the eye uh, from a scientific point of view for many, many years, but until there was an instrument to measure something related to ocular biomechanics, we couldn't really do anything about it. So really, basically, if you want to boil it down to a simple understanding, it's telling us how good of a shock absorber is the cornea and, and the other uh, tissues of the eye. Dave Luce, uh, who's not with us any longer, uh, uh, pioneered this, this issue, discovered the measurement of corneal hysteresis, and really uh, gave the world this gift. Uh, so I always take a moment to, to uh, thank Dave and remember him for all of his work. Uh, the, the instrument that measures the corneal hysteresis is called the ocular response analyzer. This is how it works. In basic, we shine a beam of infrared light on the cornea. We deform the cornea with an air jet and we monitor the deformation. When the cornea becomes applinated from the force of the air jet, we get a signal peak, but the air jet continues to impinge upon the cornea until there is a slight indentation. And then as the air jet reduces in velocity and the cornea comes back to normal, you get a second signal peak. So it's kind of a, what goes up must come down, what goes in must come out. That's the signal that comes off of the instrument. The green curve there represents the rise and fall of the force function placed on the cornea by the air jet. It's a symmetrical uh, increase and decrease of force. And the red curve there represents the optical system. And the two peaks you see are the inward and the outward applination events when the cornea becomes flat on the way in and the way out. The offset between the two pressure values that we obtain uh, at those uh, two applination events is the hysteresis. If the cornea behaved like a spring, there would be no hysteresis and the cornea would flatten at the same um, uh, point in time or at the same pressure on the way in and the way out. The offset is a result of the cornea uh, resisting deformation, it resists the deformation on the way in, and then it resists the, the, the uh, return to its original configuration on the way out. The average of those two pressure points gives us a very good Goldman equivalent pressure measurement, and the difference between those two describes the cornea's effect on the IOP measurement, which we term corneal hysteresis. So that's what we're going to talk about a lot this evening. Just so you're aware, the average value in a normal population from many, many clinical studies is about 10.5. It's just a number, 10.5 is average. Standard deviation is about 1.5. It's pretty stable diurnally and, um, and it's fairly stable with age. So that just kind of uh, tees it up a little bit so you understand the numbers when people start throwing them around tonight. The device also measures something called IOPCC. This is a pressure measurement that is less affected by the biomechanics and the thickness of the cornea. It agrees with Goldman on average but it is not influenced by corneal properties like Goldman tonometry is. So it's a Goldman-like number that, that we believe is giving you something closer to the true pressure. And we like to think of it as how a Goldman tonometer would measure if the Goldman tonometer were not negatively affected by these biomechanics and other artifacts of the cornea. Uh, the way the information looks on the measurement screen of the instrument, you have your IOPCC that I just described here at the top, the corneal hysteresis in the middle, the IOPG, which is a more traditional Goldman equivalent reference value so that you can appreciate maybe you've been over or underestimating the pressure in this patient's eye all along. And then a bit of a uh, quality indicator like a signal strength indicator uh, called the waveform score, which is on a scale of zero to 10. So that's, uh, that's the end of my stuff. I'm going to make myself disappear again and turn it back over to Ike. 
Thanks, Dave. That's a, that's an excellent overview. And as you can see, it's it's a, it's a term that those who aren't familiar with, I think, you know, it does help to have some of those examples. And it's truly a, an assessment of cordial biomechanics and occlusive biomechanics in general. So let's talk about how do we apply it. That's I think what people want to hear. And to help us do that, we've divided up the next uh, few minutes in different topics. We'll use a few cases to sort of dive into uh, some of the aspects when it comes to risk, when it comes to making treatment decisions, and when it comes to understanding certain values that come out from the device itself. Uh, if we can go to our next slide, we're going to start off with uh, Felipe Medeiros from Duke again. And Felipe, if you can just talk about uh, maybe presenting a case in terms of how you look at this in terms of risk assessment. So thank you for being here, Felipe. Great. Thank you. Thank, thanks, everyone. Thank you, Ike. Uh, uh, thank you, Dave. Thanks, Ike, for the very nice introduction. And um, so uh, th this is an interesting case. It illustrates uh, corneal hysteresis as, as a risk factor in glaucoma. This is actually a patient of mine that I saw back. I was still in, in San Diego. And um, this is a 62-year-old uh, uh, male. He has a diagnosis of primary open-angle glaucoma and had been treated over time with medication and laser trabeculoplasty and had pressures always on the low side uh, in the low teens on maximum uh, medical therapy. His corneal thickness were about average, 545 in the right eye and 541 in the left. And as you can see here, I'm illustrating here the left eye, you can see that he had pretty severe damage to the optic nerve. So this shows the nerves from 2003 to 2013. It's hard to uh, uh, see any changes here because the nerves are really uh, quite already damaged. Uh, but if we look at the visual fields, this patient had a... Uh, double arcuate defect. You can see on the baseline visual fields. And over time, they show a progression extinction of that dub double arcuate defect. You can see here uh, the Humphrey GPA uh, analysis. And if you always compare to the baseline here, you can see that it's showing uh, as a, uh, the triangles here, showing the areas of worsening uh, next. And uh, over time, this patient showed progression, clearly progression, enlargement of those uh, arcuate defects, despite pressures that were quite low and despite a um, normal corneal thickness. So it's an interesting case, uh, especially because the corneal hysteresis for this eye was 6.1. So it's a very low value uh, um, in this patient. And that Again, that uh, brings the idea here of, uh, uh, illustrates the point of corneal hysteresis being a risk factor for uh, uh, glaucoma progression. So this slide here, uh, I don't know if you, you do want to go over this already or do you want to talk a little bit about the, the case? Uh, Sure, Felipe. I, actually, I think that'll be. A, I think if you could review these two graphics, because these these graphics I, I know have come from your work. Yeah. And uh -huh. if you can maybe just just you know okay. discuss so what these show yeah. here, we get into the risk factors. Sounds good. So th this these plots here, they come from a, a a prospective study that we did, exactly looking at corneal hysteresis as a uh, uh, risk factor for glaucoma progression. So what we did, we had a cohort of about uh, uh, about 110 eyes that we followed over time. And all eyes, we got a uh, corneal hysteresis at baseline, and we followed them over time with the purpose to see if corneal hysteresis was predictive of those eyes who would progress over time. And what you see here on the uh, plots here on your left is that you see the slopes of visual field loss. And uh, the eyes are divided here in eyes with low corneal hysteresis below the average and eyes with high corneal hysteresis above average. And you can see that uh, uh, you see lots of eyes in the low corneal hysteresis that were progressing uh, and some progressing actually quite fast, but you don't really see many slopes uh, going down in the eyes with high corneal hysteresis. Uh, 
so there were essentially no rapid progressors actually in this group. Uh, and the, the plot here on your right is a plot that illustrates how a combination of corneal hysteresis and intraocular pressure uh, helped explain the rates of change, helped explain the uh, change in visual field over time. So in particularly, the interesting thing to look is that a combination of low corneal hysteresis with high intraocular pressure was particularly harmful. So you can see in, in the area there of um, uh, that you have the uh, red uh, curves. And the, the numbers, the little numbers that you see there, they were uh, uh, rates of visual field loss, the percentage of visual field loss per year. So let's say minus 3% per year, which is uh, uh, minus 3% per year may actually sound small, but actually you have to think about this in, in that it will accumulate over time. So if I have minus 3% per year, in 10 years, I lost one third of the visual field. So it's actually an extremely fast progression. So uh, low corneal hysteresis and high intraocular pressures were particularly harmful. If you actually had high corneal hysteresis, even when you had somewhat higher pressures, uh, the rates were not particularly fast. So showing that corneal hysteresis was protective. So again, this plot here illustrates how the combination of a low hysteresis and high pressure was quite detrimental and uh, was present in those eyes with rapid progression over time. So I want to bring in um, both Paul and Justin on this. Thank you so much, Felipe. And before I do that, I wanted to ask you, Felipe, I mean, we, we know risk factors like OCT, CCT, you know, play a role in uh, glaucoma progression uh, risk factors. What, what is the strength of hysteresis versus, for example, looking at IOP only or, right. or looking at an OCT finding? Can you just comment on that? And then I'm, I'm going to ask Paul and Justin how they practically use hysteresis in terms of risk factors compared to mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, IOP is still, a, uh, of course, a, a, a very important risk factor. And um, when we looked at, in this study, we looked at different risk factors. Uh, we didn't include OCT in this particular one, but we looked at corneal thickness, for example, and we actually found that corneal hysteresis uh, was about three times stronger than corneal thickness in explaining the risk of, of uh, a progression over time. Um, so there's more to the cornea than what is captured by just the corneal thickness. Paul, let me bring you in on this one. Um, I mean, you know, seeing Felipe's work and having your own practical experience, you know, what do you, how do you weight hysteresis uh, compared to other risk factors and how do you incorporate that into making a decision for how aggressive to treat? Well, I mean, after all these Zoom meetings, you think I wouldn't figure it out. Um, <laughs> thanks for having me again, everybody. I appreciate that. Uh, great question. I think what, what hysteresis does, it provides me context for my pressures, right? It gives me an understanding of what does that pressure mean? What does a pressure, let's say, of 25 and an ocular hypertensive mean? Now, of course, we're going to use nerve findings and fields and everything else all together to give us a picture. But let's say you have, for instance, an example of a, every patient of mine gets a hysteresis every consult, no matter what. And it gives me an understanding, for instance, let's say example, a, his, a hocker hypertensive pressure of 25 with normal fields and normal nerves. If their hysteresis is 12 or 13, I'm much more relaxed saying leave them alone for a year. If their hysteresis is seven or eight, I'm treating them. And, and so it gives me that understanding and that context of how aggressive I want to be, what's the likelihood I want to follow up with them, and gives, again, context in terms of what does that pressure mean for that patient, more than, let's say, CCT or anything else. And Justin, what about you? I mean, and do you feel that CCT is still relevant? I mean, do we need to still measure CCT if we're getting hysteresis? And how do you how do you look at hysteresis in your, your management of patients? Yeah, I... I I think of glaucoma like a big puzzle. That's the way I try to think about it. There's a lot of pieces to the puzzle. Corneal hysteresis is definitely one of those pieces. And I'm trying to generate a risk profile for every patient that I'm seeing that has glaucoma. And yeah, I still care about central corneal thickness. We know from the OAT study that thin corneas matter. But if you put me on the spot and said, which one do I care about more? It's definitely corneal hysteresis with all the data that's out there on it. And so I just generate a risk profile. I have a patient that has a thin cornea that has a low corneal hysteresis, has an elevated intraocular pressure with early retinal nerve fiber layer thinning, and maybe not a visual field defect. That patient makes me really concerned. Patient with, you know, a 550 cornea, uh, you know, 10 
corneal hysteresis, maybe early retinal nerve fibrillary thinning, thinning. Just like Paul, I'm maybe not as nervous. I'm still going to follow that patient, but I'm not going to maybe bring them back as quickly. Yeah, I think just just to add something here, it's it's important to to point out that in general, uh, a thin cornea will be related to a low hysteresis. So the hysteresis and thickness they are related. Uh, of course, they are not perfectly related, and the case uh, that I showed actually illustrates that. But uh, in general, you will find that patients with thin corneas will tend to have somewhat lower hysteresis. So it's not that they will. Uh, disagree all the time. Yeah, where I find it really useful is when you have a, a pachymetry reading that's in the middle 500, 550, 540, and then you have a higher lower history. So that really differentiates those patients. When it's like 620 hit a CCT, you usually do have a high history, and you're much more relaxed in general in that patient. So yeah, it's yeah, like exactly. middle 500s where I really, really do find it makes great usefulness. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I want to add a comment uh, for the audience. I should have mentioned that, that we are taking questions. I see some of you have asked some good questions, and we will come to them because they fit within some of the other cases. I want to ask uh, back to Philippe again. Um, number one, knowing what you know now, the case you presented back in 2003, uh, if that patient presented now, what would, would you do anything different in that case? I mean, the pressures were already kind of 10 to 12. They were on meds. Would you look at other factors? So, what would you do different? I mean, I know it's hard to tell you now, but here's the interesting thing. I ended up doing a trabeculectomy in this patient, which is which is not something that a lot of people would actually do, but I ended up doing after seeing the progression and seeing the the, the very low corneal hysteresis. I ended up doing a trabeculectomy with mitomycin seeing this patient. Um, I don't have the subsequent visual fields because uh, uh, I actually. Uh, didn't uh, get them for this case. I left the UCSD, but uh, the patient then the pressures were controlled very low. Of course, the trabeculectomy also helped to prevent uh, fluctuations in the pressure. Uh, but the patient had been stable after that, so I ended up doing that in this particular case. So I think seeing a patient with a, 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 that kind of visual field defect, threatening fixation, and a very low corneal hysteresis here should be something that uh, 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 you, you should then uh, consider a more aggressive treatment. A uh, couple questions here that come in. Um, so you've spoken about all of you do hysteresis when you assess a patient. How often do you repeat it? Uh, do you use it to monitor? Um, I know Paul's going to get into a bit of treatment planning, but in, what's your, what's your, what, what do you advise as far as uh, doing it, reevaluating it, repeating the measurements over time? I mean, I, I, it's interesting because you do find studies that show when you bring the pressures down, the hysteresis does tend to go up a lot of patients. Now, I don't use it to monitor, to be honest with you. I still monitor using my fields and my OCTs and, of course, IOP. But I, it is interesting. If you do, let's say, a TRAB or you do, say, bring pressures down significantly with drops, you will find that hysteresis goes up, which is it was just kind of an interesting finding. And actually, as we age in life, we know that the hysteresis does go down as well. So I think it's nice over time to do these every once in a while, but I don't use it to actually follow patients directly. I'd love to hear everybody else's thoughts. Uh, yeah, I'm similar. I, I I get it on every visit, to be honest with you, but it's it's more so because I'm getting the other measurements that we're gonna talk about in a little bit here, like IOPCC, which I really wanna see. And obviously you get corneal hysteresis with that, so I'm always glancing at it, but I'm more interested on repeat visits on what's happening with IOPCC and even the IOPG, so I can have all those those, those data points. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I find that uh, uh, over time, the IOPCC will uh, give you more value for monitoring uh, in, in general, uh, because the, the corneal hysteresis will not tend to change that much over time uh, as you're following the patient. Well, good. We have a number of questions on looking at IOPCC and Goldman. I'm going to save them for Justin, because you're going to kind of get into that a little bit, Justin, in terms of looking at those values. But let's go to Paul. Um, thank All you so right. much, Felipe, for discussing it. I really recommend reading his papers, um, the DIG study and longitudinal studies that have been done. They are extremely, extremely well done, and it's rare to see the kind of evidence in some of our diagnostics. So, Paul, uh, can you maybe lead us into how do you incorporate hysteresis in treatment planning and making decisions for treatment? 
Absolutely. Again, thanks. Great job, Felipe. Fantastic. And you're one of the reasons why I, I started using this machine because of your studies as well. So thank you for all your work as well. Uh, but I'm going to talk about some couple cases. I'll try to go pretty quick for the sake of time. Uh, but I'll, next case, here we go. So, you know, for me as a glaucoma specialist in, in Wisconsin, kind of in, a, in an area where there's no other specialists, I get all types of referrals. The ones who are, does this have, person have glaucoma or this person is, you know, advancing with the pressure of 10, like Felipe showed. And, and so this patient is one of those earlier patients where they were treated for many years, uh, 73 year old on uh, of systemic medications on latanoprost for a few years, T max of 26, so middle 20s or so, medicated down to 21, so not a fantastic result response or to uh, PGA. Pachymetry in the middle 500s, not very, very high or low, but hysteresis was pretty good 11.6 in the right eye and 12.3 in the left eye, so pretty high, which was uh, again 10.5 is average. Patient's going to complaining of, of ocular surface disease. As we all know, the killer to compliance is ocular surface symptoms. And so patients you can see in the left, some standing, tear from breakup time was very poor. Um, had some issues with um, from, from staying on medications in general. Early, early cataract, but vision was still pretty good. And had healthy nerve fiber layer, suspicious optic nerves, but no dyscheme. And uh, as you'll see here, we go and show the uh, nerve fiber layer and, see, and visual fields, pretty healthy fields, nothing that was that scary. Low reliability, of course, patient didn't have a great uh, time taking tests that had some high fixation losses in both uh, eyes. But look at the fields and look at the OCTs now. The OCT shows a nice healthy GCC, some floaters there you can see. <laughs> and uh, on the right there, has some larger cupping, but uh, again, the uh, RNFL looks fairly stable, fairly healthy rather, the t stint looks pretty good, and again, GCC was pretty healthy. So there's a patient who has high hysteresis, T-max in the upper 20s, middle to upper 20s, uh, taking latanoprost with very minimal um, uh, response. So is it POAG? Is it ocular hypertension? And, and cut, what do we do? And so do we need to treat this patient right now? With those high hysteresis, kind of like Felipe showed in his graph, if you have a high hysteresis of 11 or so, having a pressure in the 20s, you really didn't see significant progression over time. And so for this patient, I, I decided to take this patient off uh, the latanoprost and said, hey, let's just stop the latanoprost. Let's watch you. And actually we've been watching now over a year plus and fields have not changed actually. It's been pretty stable. And again, we'll always keep watching fields and nerves and IOP. But this is an example where I felt much more confident by having a high hysteresis saying, I'm okay, I feel comfortable. If I just looked at the pachymetry alone being 560, 550, that wouldn't tell me a lot of information to say, uh, maybe I will treat this patient. Number two, it also explained why maybe the, um, the PGA didn't show a significant response. Uh, uh, Nate Radcliffe and others have shown some great data showing that when you have high hysteresis, we don't sometimes see a significant response to PGA is quite as high or as much as we see with, let's say, lower hysteresis as well. We'll talk about that. But that was also another you know, rationale for maybe why the PGA didn't work as well. So that was one extreme, kind of, a, do this patient have glaucoma? Do they need to be treated? Well, the other kind of scenario is a patient like this, a 60-year-old a patient who's had POAG for about 11 years, no significant family history on a bunch of systemic medications, but also on a bunch of ocular medications, bimatoprost, bromonidine, timolol, so not having a great deal, again, time, uh, tolerability was a big issue, compliance was a big problem as well. Pressures were in the low 20s max, uh, and then medicated into the middle to upper teens on multiple visits. Uh, Pachymetry, pretty again, 530s or 540, nothing really significant either way. But the hysteresis, again, was very low, 7.9 in the right eye and a little, little bit lower in the left eye, not too bad. But that right eye was concerning of 7.9. And when you look at, and, and Justin's going to talk more about this IOPC, which is this kind of hysteresis adjusted IOP, but it does give you some understanding. So again, the IOPG, which is the Goldman equivalent, was kind of in the upper teens, low, sorry, it was in the, the middle teens rather. But when you look at the IOPCC, the hysteresis, adjusted pressures, it actually showed me that the pressures were in the higher teens to low 20s, actually. So what I thought was controlled for a while probably really wasn't really as controlled as I thought. Uh, and you can see here are the nerves. Uh, looking at her exam, pseudophagia had cataract surgery, and it, we'll go to the next slide here. Nothing really fancy with this slide. But the fields look pretty good back in 2016. Again, so when the patient was started on PG, uh, was started on many medications, uh, PGA was fine. So we said, okay, PGA pressure upper teens. Well, then in 2019, was in the upper teens uh, with pressures, but look at that field in the right eye. So we added a combination of and Timolol to that patient. Came back again this past year here, this uh, last few months ago, and look at that right eye. Fields are progressing pretty rapidly. And so the question is why? This patient's pressure from the middle teens on El Goldman, and, but yet the IOPC showed pressures were probably in the higher teens, lower 20s. So this is an example of a patient where I said, hey, look, I'm kind of worried. Look at the nerve fiber layer. 
progressing over five years, that inferior nerve fiber layer rim is completely gone now compared to what it was about five years ago as well. You can see the, the inferior RNFL completely gone now and that big bundle defect inferiorly. And so next slide, basically look at the CC, GCC, it's completely wiped out in the right eye. So this is a patient under my nose had gotten worse significantly. And I kept kind of watching and then the IOPC recently kind of tell me, hey, Paul, you might have to worry about something here. So in summary, this is a patient who is progressing despite pressures that were in the middle teens in that one eye only more than the left eye. Left eye was pretty stable on fields and nerves. And what, what could be the rationale why? Well, the low CC, low hysteresis. And there's actually studies that show that when you have asymmetric progression, majority of the time, 90 plus percent of the time, it's actually the hysteresis that's lower in that eye than the eye that's actually more stable. So this is the kind of patient I said, hey man, I'm not gonna leave him alone on drops. I'm gonna do something more aggressive here. So here's a patient, we can go next here. Um, I went ahead and did surgery. <laughs> so uh, decided to go ahead and perform a, in this patient, because the conch was kind of angry and irritated from all the drops, I did a discodilation and otomy, uh, kind of a GAT with discodilation. Now the pressure came down to low, uh, low teens, down to 10, 12 range actually, on a PGA, and that's been stable again. So it's been a few months ago, this is what recent case. But I think that's the reason why for me, I got more aggressive and I felt more comfortable saying, yes, we have to pursue something more and explain why the patient was getting worse based upon fields. Well, thanks, Paul. I mean, that, those are two great examples. Um, you know, uh, often often stopping therapy is a difficult decision to make, and I think we've learned, you know, what uh, corneal biomechanics may tell us about true IOP, and you explained it well. I thought it was very interesting in that second case you showed where you had such a difference in the uh, corneal hysteresis between the right and left eye. And I've seen the same thing where we have eyes with very asymmetrical glaucoma, and the eye with more severe disease tends to have uh, a lower hysteresis, and so that relationship is quite interesting. I want to ask the panel here in terms of how do you incorporate hysteresis in terms of your target pressure? Um, do you aim for lower target, for example, if you have a lower hysteresis? How does that how does that adjust? Because we always talk about target pressure, right? We talk about a percent reduction or an absolute number based on studies. Um, how do how do you practically use hysteresis to set a target pressure? Um, you know, when you're when you're starting therapy in glaucoma. Anyone want to take that one? Sure, I'm happy to. Uh, you know, for me, it's it, it, it. We all set target pressures when we're dealing with our glaucoma patients, and it goes back to what I mentioned earlier, which is I'm generating a risk profile for all my patients. And so, if there's a low corneal hysteresis versus a patient with a high corneal hysteresis, I'm going to set a more aggressive target pressure for that patient with the low corneal hysteresis. Still looking at all the other things, like Paul showed, the visual field, the OCT, what was their central corneal thickness. But that low hysteresis is going to make me say, I need to probably drive this pressure a bit lower and my intervention may be different as well. I may refer for surgery in my practice, refer to a surgeon like one of you guys to do surgery earlier than I would where I might keep them if it was a high hysteresis and just treat with medications. So I, I want to get into, thanks for that, Justin. I want to get into an um, interesting point that Paul mentioned in terms of What's the evidence say in terms of hysteresis in terms of how well your therapy will work? Um, you know, you mentioned something about PGs. Could you elaborate on that more perhaps? I mean, Felipe or Paul, if you want to talk about that, how does it uh, maybe perhaps explain non-responders or does it certain does it, does it maybe lead to a certain selection of therapy, whether medication class or surgery? Go ahead, Felipe. I'll, I'll... So the, there is some evidence showing that patients with high hysteresis or thicker corneas they show a uh, lower response to uh, IOP lowering treatment. Uh, and there may be different reasons for this. Uh, one of the reasons may be actually um, the, an artifact on the way we check the pressure, for example. If you think about a patient who has, let's say, a thick cornea uh, and has an overestimated Goldman measurement, uh, and when you put that patient on medication, the, the pressure is not as high as you think. It's actually a lower pressure. So then if the pressure is already lower, then the effect of medication ends up being smaller. Okay, so part of it is actually an artifact of the, of the, of the pressure measurement, of the Goldman measurement. Uh, but there are some other possible explanations for this. Uh, some people have shown that you may actually have potentially an effect of prostaglandin analogs on the corneal properties that would actually change the corneal properties by acting on the uh, 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 
extracellular matrix. So, uh, and in, in a way it would make the cornea maybe more soft. Okay, so uh, I do think in, uh, that most of this is probably explained by an artifact on the measurement. Actually, that's my opinion about it. Paul, what are your thoughts on that? And and also, I mean, you know, how do you incorporate hysteresis when it comes to making decisions for surgery? You gave a good example of that in your last case, but what are your thoughts on on how does it perhaps, uh, you know, affect what therapy you use and whether it's medications or surgery, or do you incorporate it at all or not? Yeah, no, that's a great point. I, I think that when um, the, the hysteresis is high like that, and, and I do have a patient I want to treat, let's say alcohol hypertension, it's, Felipe is right. We just don't know. Is it an artifact? Is it some absorption issues? We just don't know. Um, is, is it uh, biomechanical properties and, you know, not allowing it to work as well? But I will say I, I tend to do SLT in those patients. <laughs> and I have found in my own clinical non-published uh, experience that um, SLT works better in those patients that have highest hysteresis than PGAs do tend in my experience. So I tend to push the SLT world uh, in those patients if I have to treat them for ocular hypertension for a lot more patients that way. Um, in terms of setting target pressures or deciding to do, perform surgery, in that kind of a case, it does help me understand which patients I would pursue surgery. I have a younger patient in the 50s, let's say, who let's say has low hysteresis, I will tend to perform some surgery of some sort, that's laser terechoplasty, some MIGS procedure a lot of times, because I do appreciate the fact that fluctuating IOP is gonna be an issue for a lot of these patients on multiple drops. So if I have to put someone on multiple drops, I tend to prefer, prefer, uh, perform surgery, especially if I have a low hysteresis. And my target pressures tend to be a bit lower in those patients, but it's not a rule of thumb. Unfortunately, it's more a gestalt for me based upon all the other risk factors that we analyze every day, I tend to use hysteresis as a way to say, okay, do I want to do surgery in this patient? Should I feel comfortable watching? And then if I do want to do surgery, you know, kind of how low do I want the targets to be? And they tend to be a little bit lower, especially the younger they are. Well, great points. And I think, as Justin said, I mean, this is all part of that glaucoma puzzle, right? And understanding what pieces go to where and making that decision. Uh, also important to think about, again, is, is it's a vital sign. If any of us feel the value of CCT or corneal biomechanics are important, for assessing risk factor or adjusting for IOP or both, obviously, you know, it's more than just simply adjusting the IOP, then I look at kind of hysteresis as kind of corneal biomechanics on steroids, right? That this just gives us so much more information about uh, ocular rigidity and, and hysteresis that I think are important when it comes to making these decisions. So now I'm gonna go to Justin. Justin, there's been a lot of questions that have come up and I've kind of delayed them a little bit because you're gonna speak about this next topic, which is how do you, you know, incorporate IOPCC do you adjust IOP? Do you make any adjustments for Goldman when you measure hysteresis along with Goldman? And, uh, you know, how do you look at IOP in this new light of hysteresis? So I'll let you present your case, Justin, if we can get the slides up again. And then we have a number of questions that have come up. I'll make sure we get to them and have everyone kind of comment on how do they look at IOPCC? How do they adjust? What values did they use? Is there still a role for Goldman? So those are some of the questions that come up. Justin, back to you. Great. Yeah, thank you. So pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks to everyone and, and for taking the time. But this is a patient that we've been following for a long time, uh, came into our clinic uh, really for a second opinion and, and was with us for quite some time. Believed to be normal tension glaucoma. We never found pressures above 20 that we knew of. Uh, you can see the ocular history there, some cataract surgery, had a yay capsulotomy as well on multiple medications uh, for the pressures. Highest we know of we think is about 20 and in target we were shooting for around 15 or so. Uh, we get over to the the current visit when the patient came in and vision's 2020 in both eyes and we get into you know goldman applination thermometry i got 15 in the right eye and 12 in the left eye and then with the ocular response analyzer spitting out some other really nice information the outpcc was reading 21.8 in that right eye 14.2 in the left eye and then you can see the hysteresis as well 8.7 in the right 10 and a half in the left pachymetry normal on the maybe thicker side and then everything else really pretty normal in this patient. We can go to the next slide. And so here's the visual field. So real glaucoma in both eyes, okay? And, and what you're seeing here is on the right eye, dating back to October of 2020, and then recent visit, this is a recent patient. I just saw this patient about a month ago. The visual field showing some change in my opinion. You can see the pattern standard deviation getting a little bit worse. It made me a little nervous seeing that. That is the same eye that had an IOPCC of 21, but the Goldman reading looked pretty good for hysteresis on the low end. The left eye, dating back to February of 19, I put that visual field up there just to show you how stable the, the left eye had been. So really a major visual field defect, bad glaucoma, 
but really a stable visual field defect from February of 19 all the way to February of 2021. The other complication with this, if we look at the OCTs in the next two slides here, is that it was hard to get an accurate OCT because of the atrophy around the optic nerve head. Not once really did I feel comfortable from February of 2017 all the way through February of 2021 in either the right or left that I was getting a good accurate OCT to make a really good assessment on retinal nerve fiber layer thinning. And so I had to make my decision off of what's going on with the visual field? What do I think their intraocular pressure is? And so the point of this case is I didn't necessarily, and I'm not doing anything different right now. I'm seeing this patient back in a month. I'm going to reassess the visual field in that right eye because that's the eye that's making me nervous and hesitant because of the IOPCC being elevated with the low corneal hysteresis. And it looks to be like there's some visual field progression occurring where in the other eye, I've had good stability for an extended period of time. Pressure is good both on Goldman and IOPCC. I feel pretty comfortable continuing to monitor that patient. And we may make a change and have to treat something in the right eye based on what that repeat visual field looks like in a month or so. Well, thanks, Justin. I mean, there's been a number of questions that have come up, and I'm going to throw them out there for the group to answer. Um, and a lot of them have to do with looking at Goldman. Um, for example, do you still use Goldman and or at the same time, or can Aura be a replacement for Goldman? Anybody want to comment on that question? Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll say a few things about that. I, I think uh, Aura could easily replace Goldman. We we have a tendency, Goldman has been around for, what, uh, 80, 60 years, uh, and, but it, it, it it's hard to, to, to uh, uh, change something that's been around for, for such a long time. But when you look at the evidence, actually, uh, there is evidence that Goldman is, not, is definitely not as good as we think. So, uh, so when, when you think about different methods to, to measure the pressure, how can you determine which one is actually best? And I think the best way to actually determine that is by looking to see which measurement is better predictive of uh, your risk of losing visual field in glaucoma. So which measurement is more correlated to progression in glaucoma? Because uh, at the end, that's what really matters. For We use pressure. What, why do we measure pressure? We measure pressure because we believe that pressure is a predictive factor that's going to tell us who has a chance of progressing, of developing more nerve damage or losing visual field. So then what, what we did uh, is that we looked at um, Goldman, IOPCC, and also eye care tonometry. And we had those measurements for about four years in, 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 in patients that had been followed over time with visual fields and OCT and all that. And we showed that the IOPCC measurements over time were much more related to actually progression over time. So uh, the, the ability of those measurements to explain progression was better than with Goldman and IOPCC. And I think that's a strong evidence. So I think if people want to, uh, I would feel comfortable in moving. There are of course logistics issues that have to, uh, 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 be uh, thought about when you're uh, doing that but overall i would feel comfortable in doing that and there's by the way there's a recent uh, editorial from uh, dave friedman it was published in bridge journal where he actually claims exactly that he discussed about if it's time to actually uh, uh, move on uh, because of such evidence so I'm pretty I, bold I'll statement make a on that too yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll make a comment on that because I we've gone to that. We really are not applinate unless we need to. We've gone all strictly to IOPCC and IOPG, and we applinate when something doesn't make sense. So, like in that last patient, you know, I questioned why there was a difference between the right and left eye. So then I applinated as well just to see if things matched up. But we've actually gone to just doing aura on our patients, and we have obviously tonometers and golden applination tonometers available in all our exam lanes, but we feel comfortable enough by the work that's been done by Felipe and, and, and many others that, that we're confident enough to treat patients and manage patients that way. Yeah, by the and way, the UK, yeah, the UK GTS, they actually showed very similar results uh, uh, showing the IOPCC being better than the Goldman uh, for, for progression in the United Kingdom glaucoma treatment study. 
and the IOPG is pretty accurate compared to applanation with the gold mod. So, I mean, the IOPG gives you a pretty under, good understanding of what the applanation would be. But I would just say one more comment on, on IOP in general. As long as you have a consistent way of measuring. So, you know, the aura is very consistent and accurate when it comes to measuring multiple times. So as long as you have a consistent same machine, even if you only use the aura, the bottom line is you want a reduction from that baseline. So if you're using the same machine every time, you're going to make a decision to treat based upon fields, et cetera, and then you want that pressure down a certain percentage. So if you're using the same machine every time, you don't have to necessarily use a gold mod. You could use the aura and just make sure the pressures were coming down with those measurements. So as long as it's the same machine, it doesn't really matter what you use almost in some way. So I feel comfortable using that alone, although I do do both gold mod application and the aura. So um, just more questions here. Uh, what about using, um, how, how would you compare what you're doing with IPCC versus if you took a Goldman and adjusted for CCT? You know how there are some tables out there that people have tried to come up with to adjust your IOP value for a thicker or thinner CCT. What is your opinion of that? Is it valid or not? And how does it compare to using just basically IPCC? Just some questions on that. Anybody want to take that one? I'll do a quick, a quick answer is the problem is IOP, the IOPCC is measuring hysteresis versus pachymetry. You could have a normal pachymetry of 545 and yet have a low hysteresis, which would cause the IOPCC to be higher. So it, unfortunately, if you only use his CCT, you're not going to be able to understand that a lot of these patients, it's not a, a rigid stick, one measurement. It's actually the biomechanical properties it's measuring, which is not always correlating the same as a CCT. Exactly. The CCT is not taking into account all the properties that are relevant in explaining. You may have uh, uh, two corneas that have the same thickness, but very different elasticity or viscoelasticity. And um, this is not going to be taken into account by CCT. So in, 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 uh, in short, like those algorithms, they don't really work. Um, um, question about, um, uh, what about using, a? is there a table? For hysteresis, that if you have a hysteresis, you can then adjust your Goldman measurement. I know it sounds complicated, but if you have a Goldman IOP and given hysteresis, is there a table you can use to adjust? I, I wouldn't really recommend that. So what I do in practice, so you you get a hysteresis measurement from the ORA, but you also get the IOPCC from the instrument. So that approach doesn't really make sense to me to do that correction because you do get at the same time you get the hysteresis, you do get an IOPCC. So I don't really see a point of doing anything like that, really. Okay. Um, I want to bring Dave uh, Dave Taylor back in here as well. Um, and there's a question that's come up about maybe other technologies, like what about if you're someone who's using a Tonopen or someone who uses eye care? Uh, I mean, is there still value in using, uh, in measuring IOPCC and hysteresis? Anybody want to comment on that? There's well, some... like it kind of ties into the to the to the last question you asked about whether there's a table where you could correct Goldman based on hysteresis, and the and the fact of the matter is, um, no, you can't because all tonometers are affected by corneal properties in different ways. Um, Goldman is not affected by hysteresis or corneal thickness to the same magnitude as an old-fashioned air puff tonometer is, or to a rebound tonometer. Th those two technologies are are strongly affected by corneal thickness and corneal hysteresis. Um, so even though we talk about IOPCC as a hysteresis corrected pressure measurement, that's technically true, but it's hysteresis corrected for the way the ocular response analyzer makes its pressure measurement. You can't then therefore say, well, this person has a hysteresis of 11, so I'm gonna subtract a couple millimeters of mercury from their Goldman measurement because mm -hmm. the Goldman is affected by all these biomechanical properties and thickness in a different manner. So. You know, I, I think Dr. Singh hit on it before. Most of these devices are very repeatable. The aura is very repeatable. And as long as you're comparing apples to apples, um, you know, you should be okay as far as monitoring for changes. Okay, great. Uh, we, are, we are coming near the end and there's a bunch of questions here. So uh, what about, uh, and Dave, you can stay on here, man. You can just, you can be one of our panelists too. Um, what about in patients who have had refractive surgery? Um, what happens to hysteresis and IOPCC in patients who've had, let's say, myopic LASIK? So the, the way that IOPCC was actually derived, it's not really a simple correction to hysteresis, okay? Uh, and uh, Dave can speak more about it, but the, the reality is IOPCC, the way it's actually derived, it will suffer very little influence from uh, refractive surgery. And that was actually one of the points 
that motivated the development of this at the very beginning. And I, 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 I'm very pleased to say that I've been work, working with Dave and I worked with Dave Luce for 20 years. And at the beginning, uh, we had this prototype and we're still discussing IOPCC and, and all the, the, the algorithms to derive IOPCC. So, and th that was one of the motivations for the development of IOPCC, correct, Dave? That's right. Yeah, actually, that's when we really got a handle on what we were measuring was by looking at pre and post LASIK measurements and, and noticing how uh, the, the, the two applination events, what we call P1 and P2, changed in a different manner. And that's actually the, the IOPCC algorithm was derived from pre and post LASIK data. We basically found a way uh, to make the pressure stay the same in a pre and post LASIK population and then, you know, did some other math and, and tricky stuff to also make it agree with Goldman and, and everything else that, that makes it what it is today. But you're right, it was originally uh, inspired by looking at changes after refractive surgery. Some questions about reliability. When, when do you worry about aura accuracy it, with certain corneas, pathologies, or other, other, other findings that you have to be concerned this may not be a reliable or accurate measurement? whether it's corneal scars or corneal edema or fuchs or other pathology. You know, like this gets into the waveform score issue, which I know the other panelists have opinions on and experience with. Uh, my, my first suggestion would be whenever the waveform score is low, question the accuracy, make another measurement, make a couple extra measurements. So the waveform, it, uh, waveform score is a, is a signal quality from zero to 10. And I think the recommendation for the manufacturers, once you start getting down below six, you have to start considering that perhaps the quality may not be uh, as high as you like. Is that correct, Dave? Yeah, that's right. It's a, it's a, you know, it's not not quite an arbitrary number, but um, it comes from some from some studies. But yeah, when it starts to get below six, uh, recommend taking a few extra measurements and see what you get. Okay. Um, Maybe I throw this up to Justin. Uh, some questions about just you know operationally using it. How, how do you incorporate it in your workflow? Uh, how do patients perceive the test? Is it uh, are they afraid of it with the air puff? Uh, you know how do you put it through your office? Yeah, great question. So we just keep it in a in a pre-testing room. You know we have a couple of them and we have them in a couple different pre-testing rooms that our patients are going through and uh, it, it flows really nicely because they're getting their pre-testing work done. They're getting that pressure done. Uh, really no concern. The, the, the air puff, I never have a patient come in and complain to me at all about it. It's, it's not a traditional uh, NCT puff. Uh, and so they don't really ever come in and complain about that. And then it's kind of fun to go through, through it with the patient as well at times to show them what you're getting because they'll say, well, I think I just had this air puff test before. And you're like, well, this is actually a more sophisticated one. And so I actually spend a little time sometimes going through it with my patients as well. You know, it's been great is with, with telemedicine lately with COVID. Uh, we've done a lot of hybrid visits where patients come in, don't see me, they just take the testing and then I call them up later on. And we've actually kept some of that. And what's nice about the aura is that I can get these great reliable measurements. Patients actually have commented how much easier it is to do the aura than even applanation in some of our soot lamps. So I'll call the patients up and then do a telemedicine visit, look at their OCT and say, yep, your aura was, was good, so everything's stable, see you back in six months. So um, patients actually do find it to be really <laughs> comfortable and easy to use. What about variations in aura readings based on anatomy? A deep set eye, maybe someone squeezing, a neuro aperture, any artifact from that? I just actually pay attention to the wave score, to be honest. I mean, if that wave score is is accurate and, and an eight, a seven, uh, I feel really confident that it's a good measurement. And, and if it's getting around six or below, then I'm typically gonna recheck that and just make sure, and I'll probably do Goldman and do something different. Yeah. One thing to keep in mind is that with Goldman, we can get measurements on those eyes, but it doesn't really mean that the measurement is good. Okay, We can always get a number in the Goldman because we dial that thing, but actually in a lot of cases, it's a completely unreliable number, but there's nothing to tell you that it's actually unreliable. And all those factors that you mentioned, Ike, um, those, you know, those things can affect Goldman too, and then you, you, get, in, you get into situations with patient posture, um, you know, overweight patients leaning over in front of the slit lamp, pushing into their stomach and all those sorts of things. So all these sonometers are affected by a, a, a plethora of different uh, um, factors. And I think in many ways, the aura is, is less likely to be in fact affected by those things than, than Goldman is. I think we've seen um, patients. 
Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Paul. I was at, I had a couple of patients actually state that they they used to hold their breath a lot with applination, but they tend to be more relaxed. So I think we're in some ways it's a patient, uh, ha, you know, habitus and the patient posture. I think is easier for some people with the with the aura. Uh, I'm just going to go maybe over a couple of minutes here. Just some questions about uh, you know nowadays, of course, with the pandemic, how do you clean the device? Any concerns about uh, aerosol and non-contact tonometry? Any any comments on that from anybody here? Still using it now? Yeah, we are. And studies, there's some studies that have come out recently that, that we, we, we do not worry about aerosolization. Uh, and actually, it's not the same as an NCT. This is We don't see the same aerosolization with the Aura as some of the earlier air puff tonometers. So to me personally, I, I'm not concerned about you know spreading COVID with the Aura. I agree. I'll jump in I agree on that. We, never stopped, uh, we never stopped using it. So we've always used it and, and uh, have just not had much of a concern with that. During the beginning of the pandemic, there was a lot of discussion about that, and it, and it stemmed from a 1991 clinical study that was using some 40-year-old uh, non-contact tonometer technology, and they also put supplemental tear film and fluorescein in the eye in order to be able to photograph the splatter that came from those eyes. So two important points. One, that that's an unfair uh, comparison because of the technology used had about a 6x harder puff, and they were putting supplemental um, tear drops in the eye to photograph it. And two, those are droplets, they're not aerosols. Uh, an aer a droplet of, of 100 microns or 50 microns in diameter is not going to stay suspended in the air where somebody could get that into their respiratory tract. So yeah, there are occasions, especially if somebody has an artificial teardrop in their eye, something like that, where a droplet could be produced by any air puff device, but that is not aerosolization. Great, thank you. Um, a question about reimbursement. Is, Dave, you want to answer that one? It's reimbursable, U.S.? So there's a code, 92145. Uh, some of the Medicare jurisdictions are, are reimbursing for it. Some private payers, um, it, it, it's not a certain thing. For It's not a slam dunk. Um, um, uh, and, and a lot of practices will charge patient out of pocket for it. Um, but we get, we get most uh, practitioners saying that it's actually saving them money. It's an efficiency tool. Uh, they're not using as many disposables, especially disposable Goldman prisms these days. A lot of practices are using. And so even if they're not billing for it, uh, it's saving them time and money. Okay, great. Well, listen, I just want to just uh, wrap it up here and maybe we could have a closing slide, closing slide up on the deck here. I'm going to go around the room really quickly and ask each presenter maybe just to give a quick, you know, one or two sentences summary on what you want the audience to take home from this great session. I, I learned from all of you as well here. and. Uh, fantastic uh, dynamic here we've had tonight, so I really appreciate it. Um, so let me maybe first start off with Felipe. What what would you what would you want to add as your as your closing comments here? I think it, that's what's written there. <laughs> <laughs> we did, we did. I teed it up for you. It hit a grand slam. <laughs> I agree with what Felipe said. <laughs> right, right. Oh yeah, I I, I think the, the the two main things is that the role of of, of corneal histories is as a risk factor. Uh, to help you not only in patients who already have glaucoma, but also in patients at risk of developing glaucoma, as well as the uh, role of IOPCC as, as being potentially a more accurate, clinically relevant estimate compared to, to Goldman. Okay, Paul, I've noticed you've uh, basically downed a couple of cans of Coke already during this, during oh, this webinar. I found out I have high blood pressure now, so I'm doing my diet seven up. No more okay. caffeine. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we better end before you start to uh, to overload on the sodas. Um, any last comments from you? Yeah, all I can say is this. You know, at the end of the day, when we have all these different variables, the worst thing in the world is to not know what's happening to the patient and not understand why. This gives me the answer to all of those questions that we just don't know why. Why is someone getting worse? Why is someone not getting worse? This helps us. It doesn't give you the 100% answer, but it gives us an understanding a lot more than we had before about why a patient should be more aggressive with or why we can be less aggressive with, as you saw in those cases. So I think it's a fantastic tool that's helped me in a number of cases. All right, Justin, what about you, bud? Yeah, I mean, for me in closing, it's just made me more confident in managing my glaucoma patients. It, again, glaucoma is an artistic eye disease when we're managing it. It's a, it's a puzzle. There's a lot of tools we have to use. Those tools are still important. But this particular measurement has just made me more confident in making treatment decisions for my patients and making proper recommendations. That's great. Well, before I hand it back to uh, David, um, I want to just, again, you know, reiterate what we've heard here. I, I think the 
device is a pretty easy form factor to work in the office. Our techs find it to be very easy to use with our patients. And I think if anybody here believes IOP is important in decision making and risk factor analysis, if anyone believes corneal biomechanics and ocular biomechanics are, although we'd love to have even more information than even beyond what the aura gives us, I think that in modern day become a virus in 2021, I think this is what, what our current standard of care is. And so uh, for me, it's taken some time to get uh, incorporating it into our practice and we've been very happy as we've done it. There are obviously a few little watch outs as you've heard already from the session today, but I hope this has been informative uh, to provide some more information about what we need to do when we come to diagnosis in glaucoma and the understanding hysteresis, what it means, how do we incorporate it, and how do we look at IOP in a more corrected fashion. So back to you, Dave, you want to finish it off for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. That was really fun and exciting. I hope everybody enjoyed it. We're going to ask that same poll question we asked at the beginning now, see if we move the needle at all. And <clears throat> that question is, do you understand how to incorporate corneal hysteresis into glaucoma decision making. So, wow, we got 95% yes right now, 88% yes, 2% no, a few people still say they need more information. So I think I think it did the job, guys. I think, um, I think we helped everybody to understand better how to incorporate these new, new metrics into glaucoma decision making. So again, thanks, thanks to everybody for joining. That's what the instrument looks like in case you're curious. And you know, Riker's been involved in tonometry back going back more than 70 years now, believe it or not. Uh, we we are, are the probably the largest single player in the tonometry business. You know, we manufacture the tonal pen, the beloved Numa tonometer, non-contact tonometer, we invented it, ocular response analyzer. So we are we have a deep heritage and a long heritage in tonometry. These devices are engineered and assembled uh, a couple hours south of where Ike is right now here in Buffalo, New York. Uh, and and this is the only device on the market that provides corneal hysteresis and corneal compensated IOP, with the exception of these uh, ocular response analyzers, Child, the 7CR, which only provides the IOPCC measurement. So if you don't do a lot of glaucoma, if you just want something that gives you a more accurate pressure measurement, but you don't want to be uh, uh, concerned with the corneal hysteresis, then you can you can pick up that device. Looks the same, operates very similarly to the ocular response analyzer. You want to see one of these things in action, even during these virtual times, we can do a demonstration for you virtually. Uh, just get in touch with us. As I mentioned, we're going to send out a link to uh, uh, view this video, uh, and you're going to get an email to do a survey, so you can get in touch with Riker. We'd be happy to uh, put on a virtual or an in-person demo for you if you want to see how this thing works in your office. And um, um, don't forget to go back to the Rikert website. We're going to do this again tomorrow with Ike with a whole different group of docs uh, targeting uh, our, our friends on the other side of the pond. We've got Gus Gazzard, Mark Tutenberg, and uh, Cynthia Roberts is going to join us tomorrow to talk more about corneal hysteresis and IOPCC. And then in a couple weeks on April 8th, uh, we're going to talk about the CAT tonometer prism invented by Sean McCafferty, pictured there on the bottom right of your screen, uh, and with uh, Nate Radcliffe and Paul Karpecki joining us for that session. So some great education being put on by Riker this spring in place of the trade shows that we hope and know will resume later this year. We look forward to seeing everybody out there uh, in person. And um, between now and then, drop us an email, say hello, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks again, everybody on the line here tonight, everybody who joined and our panelists and Ike Ahmed, our, our moderator. We really appreciate you taking the time to be with us this evening. Take care. Take care, guys. Thank you. Be well. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Great job.